Whenever we let go of our rulers and look through the window, there was a whole world out there, everywhere around us, of seemingly random freeform geometry. You might be aware that I have some Rhino development classes for you on the Teachable platform, and my goal is to expand those classes with different subjects that I might know a thing or two about. One of them is NURBS geometry. And here I will make a short introduction into that magical world. The final course I'm planning to make will probably be at least two hours long, so we can use this video as a test to see if you are at all interested in something like that. If you want to know the difference between mesh and NURBS geometry, two main methods of representing geometry in 3D, I made a video a while ago about that, and you will find the link in the description. So you can see that first if you want, but if you don't, that's fine, you don't have to, you can follow along just as well. If you have some clue about NURBS, you will know that non-uniform rational B-spline surfaces and curves are a set of polynomial equations that can be used to model, in theory, infinitely precise freeform geometry, any shape you can imagine. Very simply said, since the very early human history, as our knowledge got molded and shaped by peoples like the ancient, ancient Egyptians or later the ancient Greeks or later non-ancient people, we developed mathematics and geometry which we could use in architecture to represent, model and eventually build objects. However, we were usually very limited with simply dis simple discrete lines or regular shapes like circles and arcs. And much, much later, we managed to develop functions in order to describe regular 3D bodies like spheres, cylinders, cones, toruses, and so on. But whenever we let go of our rulers and look through the window, there was a whole world out there, everywhere around us, of seemingly random freeform geometry. Geometry that we could model in clay or in marble, but not really mathematically described. So how could we do that? Now, I said we used functions to describe regular bodies. At the same time, we were all aware of the general behavior of functions since our elementary school. With functions, uh, as we let one of the variables change, we can plot the result of the function on a graph. But it was very hard, if not impossible, to do that backwards. To take a stone and say, how can I create a function that once I plot its graph, I get exactly this surface? And with NURBS geometry, we kind of managed to do that. Most of the credit for developing NURBS goes to two people whose names I will certainly mispronounce, but here it goes. Pierre Bézier and Paul de Castelgeau. Not surprisingly, both of them worked for car manufacturers. The first one for Renault and the second one for Citroën, famous French car manufacturers. I say not surprisingly because industrial design was definitely hungry for mathematical description of freeform shapes, much more than architecture. Gaudi was somehow managing without it, but there weren't that many Gaudis back then. And you might already recognize the name Bezier from Bezier Curves, and I will just mention them shortly here and talk about them more in the full course. De Castelgeau's name is not so familiar, but we will go through a very important algorithm that bears his name. All in all, from the ship industry over car manufacturers, the end of 1980s and the beginning of 1990s introduced commercially available CAD packages with NURBS geometry inside. It first appeared in software like CATIA many, many years ago, and then in the recent decades became very popular, popular through uh, Rhino. But nowadays it is integrated in many, if not most of the CAD software. Open NURBS sped up that development a lot. Back in the day, however, NURBS was rarely used in architecture. As mentioned, Gaudi didn't have a computer, unfortunately, and later on a lot of architects, even when they seemingly designed a freeform shape, they did this very cleverly by combining regular shapes, like parts of a sphere or a torus, and so on, using mathematically defined curves like parabolas to describe their geometry. Foster and Partners did that a lot, I know because I worked on many of their projects, and Simplicity of modeling aside, one of the main reasons to do that was repetition. On regular 3D shapes, when you divide the surface into discrete elements, for example glass facade panels, you have a lot of repetition. And that was usually much cheaper to build than having every single glass panel unique. Now, in the meantime, since all those elements are produced by CNC machines, it almost doesn't matter if they're all different or all the same, and that opened the gates for a lot of 
freeform geometry. Even the aforementioned Foster and Partners designed more and more completely freeform geometry as the 21st century brought a wave of wavy architecture. Architects like Frank Gehry or Zaha Hadid did not let themselves be restrained by a straight line or a flat plane. So I worked on many such projects as well, designed by Zaha Hadid architects, Massimiliano Fuxas, Foster and Partners, and although they represent a challenge, they also show an immense power when it comes to the freedom of expression. But as we all know, with great power comes great responsibility. If you start designing freeform shapes, but do not really understand them, you might get into a world of trouble, a world of singularities, gaps, discontinuities, imprecisions, bad tessellations and other things that can prevent your dream from becoming reality. We can and will avoid that by learning the properties of NURBS and how to control them. I mentioned that you can use any software that supports NURBS because the mathematics does not change and the software tools for creation will be very similar, but we mostly use Rhino in our daily practice and that is what I will use for demonstrations. So what the heck is hiding behind such a funny acronym as NURBS? Let's start with the formula for NURBS. Looks a bit scary, but it is actually not. In the planned course I will dissect this into the smallest pieces so that you understand step by step how this is derived from scratch and what exactly it means. But here I will mostly talk about practical sides of NURBS and mention some functions only sporadically. What you need to understand uh, about NURBS is that it is infinitely precise. The functions are continuous. If you ever saw a wireframe of some CGI shot, you were looking at a mesh, so these tessellated animals are meshes, and that means that these triangles are flat. Imagine if you took a shape and started cutting off sides, getting a diamond-like shape, where every side is flat. The precision of your object, how smooth your object is, is defined by the size of those mesh polygons, also known as mesh faces. In the CGI and rendering world, it is very important how many triangles, polygons, faces you have. The more you have, the smoother your shapes will look, but at the same time, the rendering time, the calculation time, will be longer. So there is a big trade-off. Now here is the deal. NURBS is a mathematical formula, a polynomial, theoretically infinitely precise. I could zoom and zoom infinitely and always see a curved, smooth surface. This is how it looks in Rhino, a simple NURBS surface. But do not be fooled. What you are looking at right now is actually a mesh. It is a rendered mesh. A computer cannot show you an infinitely precise surface. This is what I mean. In Rhino you have two following commands. Show render mesh and hide render mesh. If we show our render mesh, we can see what Rhino is using to render the shape on our screen. Visualization has to work with meshes. It has to discretize the surface somehow, tessellate it. That means divide it into discrete finite elements, because as I said, it cannot show an infinitely precise surface on your screen. You don't have an infinitely strong computer. That is why you have the mesh setting in Rhino. Check it out. If you go to options, mesh, you have two options. When we change it, our mesh changes. If you have a faster CPU or GPU, you can work with smoother meshes, meaning meshes with more faces. But if I draw a vertical line and search for an intersection with the surface, the intersection will be calculated with the surface, not with the mesh, with the mathematical formula of the surface. So it will not be between the line and this flat mesh face. No, that mesh is just an imperfect representation of the perfect NURB surface. If we do the intersection between the NURB surface and the line, the point will be exactly on the mathematically defined surface. That's the big difference. However, exactly is not absolute and it will depend on different tolerances that you can also set in your settings. But more about that in the course and in one of the following videos as well because tolerance is one of the most important settings that you have to be aware of in practice and I want to talk more about it. Back to NURBS. This is a parametric definition for a straight line. You can see that this formula depends on a single parameter, u, which can usually vary between 0 and 1. So if a0 are the three coordinates of the starting point and a1 are the three coordinates of the end point, if I keep changing u and insert it back into the equation, I will get the positions of all the points in between. In the longer course, I will then take, take you step by step over different degrees of these types of equations. That will lead us to Bezier curves, where you will see how we introduce points that we know as uh, control points in NURBS, and then I will show you the uh, Decastajot beautiful algorithm. 
Why beautiful? Because it takes all those complex formulas and shows you how to generate a Bayesian curve with a very geometrically simple iterative process. Ah, it's too cool to leave for later, so let's have a peek now. If you have control points and you want to change your parameter u to generate every point on this Bayesian curve, you just need to do this. If u is 0, that means you're at the start of your curve. And if u is 1, that means you're at the end. So how do we know where is the location of u uh, when it equals 0 0.5? Let's take all these lines on our control point polygon and take a mid the middle or 0 0.5 uh, distance on them. And then connect them. Now recursively, let's do that again. We are left with two lines. Take 0 0.5 or the middle on both and connect them. And finally, we are left with one line and take the middle on it and we got our u equals to 0 0.5 on the Bayesian curve. Now, if we took all the values from u0 uh, to u1 and plotted them out, we could construct the entire Bayesian curve completely geometrically without doing any calculations. That is sometimes the beauty of geometry. You know that Goethe said, mathematicians are like Frenchmen. Whatever you say to them, they translate into their own language and forthwith it is something entirely different. And examples like this sometimes remind me of that. I do not have time here to talk about the rational Bayesian curves and how we introduce weights points that can pull the curve toward them, or how we transition from Bayesian curves to B-spline curves where we can combine multiple control polygons into a single curve. We will also address a bit complicated concept of the knot uh, vector, the one that can be uniform or non-uniform, hence together with the rationality it got to define the name. And all of that to create a NURBS curve, a completely free-form curve that we can adjust in Rhino with control points and weights. All we need to do now is expand that into two dimensions. To our u parameter, we add the v parameter in the other direction. And each of those directions will have uh, their own control point polygons and weights. And we got ourselves a NURBS surface, one that can mathematically represent basically any shape that you see around you. So I will repeat for the 10th time because that's kind of my style. I will try to cover all these interesting mathematical transitions in the course. But let's jump into Rhino and talk about what kind of influence that mathematics has on our design. Well, let's talk about some of the parameters that enter into a NURBS curve or a NURBS surface that you can use when creating them. And keep in mind, most of the time you will not need most of these, but it is interesting to know they are there when needed. First, if you draw a surface, you can always check the domain it has. And that tells you the range of the u and v parameter in respective directions. Any point on a surface will have its u and v parameter that is inserted into that big equation so that we can spit out its coordinates. And then, because we cannot generate all of the points on a surface, there is an infinite number of them, we generate a smaller, finite number. Transform that into a mesh and then the graphic card on your computer renders it to your screen for you to be able to see it. Every curve and surface has control points and by moving them around you can change the shape. More precise explanation in the course. Every curve uh, or a surface has a degree. If you try the rebuild command you will be able to see and change the number of control points but also change the degree of the curve. I do not have the time here to explain the degree so I will leave that for the course. I will just say it tells the function how far a single point can influence the rest of the curve. But let's leave that aside and here it suffices to say that you will almost always be okay with the default degree of 3 and if you lower the degree to 1 then you will basically get a polyline between the control points, which should give you a hint about the mathematics behind it. The degree 1 means that this point can only influence her small spot and does not influence the neighbors. As we increase the degree, the change in this point will influence its friends, friends of friends, etc. For NURB surfaces, you have those settings in both directions. Now, here is something you maybe never used. Select a control point and type in weight. As you increase the weight, you will be able to pull the curve toward the point. Now, you can see how rational, remember, your curve or surface are. And here is something I never used. If you remember that knot vector, you can remove and insert knots into the curves and surfaces, but I find that pretty advanced and not really needed in architecture. Probably needed in some other professions that need an incredible amount of uh, precision when designing their shapes. But we will talk about knots in the course. 
So there are all these operations you can do, like swap or flip U and V domains, re-parameterize the domains, move them from 0 to 400 or whatever to 0 to 1, for example, used very heavily in the parametric design. You can understand all these better if you understand the mathematics behind it. And you can understand how transformation from 2D to an ERP surface work. Going from XY plane to the UV space is the basis for the parametric generation of facades, for example. That is how I generated my Voronoi and Voronax structures in 3D with, with this kind of mapping. Now, there are two more things that I find very important to be explained when it comes to NURBS. Everything you see created with NURBS, however crazy and complicated it looks, it has simple two-directional surfaces at the basis of it. Even if they do not look like that, like with a sphere or with a cone, they are still 2D sheets of cloth, maybe folded in a way that one side or two sides kind of disappear, go into the singularity. So by combining those surfaces into polysurfaces is how you get to build your complex geometry. But the tiles, the building blocks are always surfaces with the U and V domain. You can use the command show edges to see the edges of the surface. On the cylinder you will see how the sheet is wrapped and on the sphere even more peculiar. Another thing, when you want to join curves and surfaces, you always have to be careful about continuity. And I will talk about it more, maybe in the course, maybe on this channel as well. But basically, if you connect two curves or surfaces, there are a couple of level, levels of continuity you can achieve. And they are usually described with the letter G. Curves or surfaces can be not continuous, meaning that curves do not meet and cannot be joined together. But then we go to G0, which means they meet at the end point or the edge, and then they can be joined there, but there is a clear kink, a seam. If you look at the curve and the tangent, they break, do not have the same direction. And then we can go to G1, so-called the tangency continuity. If you look at the tangents of the two curves, if they form a straight line, then they're collinear, they have the same direction, and you have the G1 continuity. Most of the time, enough when we're designing a smooth, continuous shape, but now if you want to go further, for some reason, you can go with uh, curvature continuity or G2. That means that not only the tangent is collinear, but the rate of change of curvature is the same. That might sound a bit tricky, but if you do not observe only the first control point, but also the second control point and make sure, for example, the distances between the points are the same, you should achieve G2 continuity. That is rarely needed, especially in architecture, but possible. G5 plus exists in theory but has no visible evidence of more continuity. How this looks in practice, how we can control that with different commands, for example blend curve this, that asks you about the continuity you want to achieve, we can talk about it in the course or in the future videos. So that was a small introduction to something that could and will be an entire detailed course. I introduced a couple of basic and a couple of random characteristics of nervous geometry and if you like what you heard and what you saw, give the thumbs up, subscribe, leave a comment and I will know that you're interested in learning more and we'll go on and invest the time to explain this subject in more detail. Until then, stay free.